And welcome to Lift FM, 98.5, 103.3 FM, and 97.9 on your FM radio dial. And of course, we are on worldwide at liftfm.com. Just a reminder that all of our broadcasts of Second Chances are available via archive at advantageradioministries.org. That is advantageradioministries.org. Click on Second Chances and then just scroll down and pick a program of your liking and uh, be ready to be blessed. And speaking of blessings, we are blessed each and every week right here at Lift FM. We meet so many unique and interesting people, people that are from all walks of life that are excited and enthused to share what the Lord has done for them. And we, and we, and we have a wonderful gentleman with us tonight. His name is Ron Peterson. Ron has uh, done a lot of things in his life we're going to learn about tonight, but uh, we're going to talk a lot about his book. But before we get into all that, we'd like to say... Good evening, Ron, and welcome to Second Chances. Greg, uh, so good to be with you tonight. And we are blessed to have you uh, with us. You know, Ron, we mention this uh, occasionally on the program, how the Lord just, you know, uh, brings us guests from all different ways. And in the case, I think, of, of you as a guest, you actually came to me, I think, from the the owner of Lift FM, uh, Joe Burke. Uh, you spoke to him, and then he sent, sent uh, you to me, and I think that's how that came to be. Is that about right? Yep, that's it. Uh, I basically, uh, you know, he kind of learned a little bit about the, my new uh, novel that's come out. He seemed uh, interested in uh, learning more about it and me, and, and one thing led to another. And uh, it's just always amazing how the Lord brings us guests. And uh, Ron, as we begin the program tonight, uh, first of all, for the sake of all of us, why don't you give me a little bit of background of, you know, who you are, you know, where you came from, did you come from a Christian home? Things, things of that nature. Sure, I I uh, grew up in New York City. Uh, I was the uh, the fourth child of five. Uh, grew up. I was born in 1950, so I'm a bona fide uh, baby boomer, and uh, grew up in a Catholic household. We were practicing Catholics, and uh, uh, so I had uh, you know a Christian since birth, and uh, you know had communion, confirmation, uh, uh, marriage, all in the Catholic Church, and, and, you know, I know Christ through through that. And uh, uh, some of the interesting things, I mean, like everyone else in, in their family have different, you know, ways of, of kind of broadening their faith and, and, and really testifying to their faith. One thing that, that really comes to mind in my family, it was kind of unique, uh, I mean, I, looking back, now on it is kind of uh, I, I draw a lot from it. My dad was uh, when I was born. My dad was an alcoholic. He'd been drinking for uh, I think about 23 years, and uh, I was uh, uh, fortunate. Uh, fortunately, when I was three years old, I mean, I was too young to even remember that you know, no one had any knowledge of my dad's drinking or problems with drinking. But he did uh, have an experience, you know, uh, with God. Uh, when I was three years old, he happened to be in jail at the time in connection with his drinking. I mean, it was just a, a terrible thing. If you know anybody who has uh, problems with alcohol, uh, you know, alcoholism is a terrible disease. And uh, But at the time, uh, alcoholism was not really considered a disease, too. It was something else, and there are all kinds of problems associated with it and everything else. But to make a long story short, truly blessing you want to talk about you know how god works in people's lives and how he blessed uh, my dad and, and our family as a result of this experience in while he was in jail he had a you know a bona fide spiritual experience and uh he uh just gave up drinking from that moment on you know when he had it that experience in jail and uh, uh not only that he which transformed his life around and affected our, our, you know, all the children, his his wife, my, so much. He impacted thousands of other people's lives in in connection with uh, alcoholism because he started a halfway house called the Fellowship Center in New York City, which grew and grew, and uh, it uh, was one is still one of the uh, uh, leaders in in the area of alcohol. Uh, treatment and and they, it focused his his ministry and practice focused on you know helping those with the problem in prisons where alcoholism is uh, you know a very serious problem. So from all of that, I I 
as you can imagine, I mean, he was developing, you know, growing this this whole ministry, and I grew up in that environment that is exposed to that and see saw how people suffered spiritually in different ways and things, and, and uh, you know, I learned a lot from that, I guess. I mean, it, just growing up in, in that environment and seeing people with all kinds of problems like that, and then being able to, uh, you know, listen to, you know, my dad's experience, his own personal experience, it was so powerful, uh, really, uh, you know, affected everyone who, who talked he talked with and, and he ministered to. So I, I, I feel very blessed. He not only tr- transformed his life, thousands of other people's lives in, in the process, and it was all related to uh, you know, this, this spiritual experience that he had. And his spirituality uh, you know, just grew and grew and, and affected you know, all of us in our family. So that, that's kind of where I, you know, my background in a nutshell to where I came from. Now, uh, do you recall the time when your dad was set free uh, through the grace of God of his alcoholism? Do you remember that uh, time uh, well uh, in, in, in your life, Ron? Uh, I, as I said, I was about three years old when he had that experience. So, I mean, it was just... My mom was, you know, you talk about, you know, an angel and everything else. Uh, you know, I, she, you know, we, I didn't know anything, really. I mean, it... it you know, by the time, the only way I knew that he had any problems with drinking was just, you know, secondhand nature through his work later on as I grew. You know, I, he would take, you know, me and the others to his halfway house, meet some of the people and, and learn about, you know, the, the whole problem. And he'd talk about it, but I never saw him in, uh, you know, in a bad way with, with drinking. And uh, so, no. Okay. Um, so, um, as you, as you, uh, you know, go through life and you're in the, this, uh, ministry around the, uh, fellowship center, um, what, what was it at that, uh, part of your life as, as you got out of school and, and, uh, got in, you know, got into, uh, the 18, 19 year old area, what was it that you thought, uh, you would be doing with your life, uh, as you, uh, became an adult? Well, it's. I think I don't want to, want to just say I was an average kid or anything, but I had dreams. You know, I grew up in New York City. I wanted to be, you know, a, a baseball player and play for the New York Yankees. And for a time, I was playing high school, uh, you know, baseball through high school and different things. I was thinking about that, and then I, I went to aviation high school in Queens, and I was thinking about, you know, this was at the time, uh, you know, when we were looking at put a man on the moon. You know, I was. Uh, uh, you know, in my teens, high school years, and, you know, that that was very attractive to me. So I was thinking about, you know, doing something in aeronautics, and I went to aviation high school and, and thinking, you know, heck, you know, maybe I could do something, you know, be an astronaut or something. So I always had, like, these big ideas and dreams. You know, I, I'm going to be a famous baseball player. I'm going to be a astronaut, astronaut, or I'm going to be this, I, I'm going to be that. And, and uh, it's, you know, it just... I had, I guess, typical dreams and imagination of doing all kinds of interesting things with my life, but, you know, things didn't always work out. You know, you have your dreams, but things, uh, you know, they get readjusted, and and you have to kind of move on and and do other things. So that's kind of, you know, where how my life experiences and and, uh, – direction uh, went. It was it just kind of lots of dreams, kind of lots of different ideas of doing things, and I enjoyed doing lots of different things, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, nothing, you know, my dreams of becoming a baseball player, an astronaut, didn't materialize, and uh, finally, uh, in school, in college, I started out in engineering, I went into architecture, and then I ended up majoring in English, and uh, I, I really started uh, having an appreciation for uh, English and the written word, studying literature, you know, as a result of that. So everything before that just, again, it seemed like it was leading me. I I look at my whole life and everything, even today, where I am today, this moment, there are lots of been doors have closed, lots of doors open. But in each case, you know, I feel like, you know, God has been leading me in, in another direction to kind of, okay, you're, this is not, you know, meant for you, and this is a door that's closed, but here are some other doors opening. And it's been that way throughout my life, and I've always find that, found that 
phenomenon, very interesting, and at times it's, it's difficult to deal with, but in the end, you know, I, I think when you look at, uh, I step back from it in a, in a kind of a spiritual perspective and say, you know, this, whatever's happening, you know, doors closing, doors opening, this is God's will, and I just, I'm going to accept it, and, you know, a lot of good and interesting things happen to me throughout my life as a result of that. I mean, you can kind of be uh, depressed or uh, uh, have uh, all kinds of uh, emotional issues because of things not working out the way you want, but you know, if you have the, the perspective that God is leading you, then that makes all the difference. So you weren't a Bronx bomber, you weren't a uh, astronaut. Uh, what did you end up doing uh, for a profession uh, once uh, once you realized that some of those dreams you had had uh, weren't going to come to fruition as far as the sports or the uh, being an astronaut? Okay, well, the, the whole English thing, you know, I graduated with a degree in English, and uh, at the time it was uh, 1973, and uh, jobs weren't plentiful, especially for English majors, and I, I, I was looking for an adventure, looking to kind of... Uh, expand and, and kind of just test, you know, see where my interest really did lie. And uh, so I, I joined the Peace Corps. I went to Ethiopia uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer serving there for two years and had a, just a, a, an awesome experience through that. And uh, as a result of that, I uh, there was a, a famine uh a, ter- a terrible famine in Ethiopia at the time while I was there. I mean, uh, lots of people were dying, and uh, just a, you know, I had firsthand knowledge of that. You know, seeing that, you know, close up, and uh, the one of the issues related to that, why it was a problem, so many people died, is that the government did not share that information about the problem with the world, uh, and uh, it wasn't until a journalist uh, from. Britain, I believe, came in and filmed the the whole um, famine and the drought and, and exposed it to the world that everyone really knew about it. And then food from all around the world just came rushing in to help the people there. And I that an idea from that just sparked, grew in me, and saying that is powerful, you know, to be able to uh, share information and and have such an impact like that. And that really uh, attracted me. So when I came back from the Peace Corps, I uh, got a master's degree at at, uh, Boston University in broadcast journalism, and I started a career in journalism. Uh, what uh, What kind of things did you do in your journalism career? Well, I started... First thing, I, I was finishing up my master's degree at Boston University, and my last semester, instead of just finishing out in courses, I got a job at a, as a news director at a small country music station in Kentucky. And I, so I started uh, working in radio as a journalist uh, from there, worked there, won a number of awards from the Associated Press my first year there, and got a job working at the, the Kentucky Radio Network, uh, just starting up at the time, and, and uh in Louisville, and uh, it was a, a network, a statewide radio news network serving about 70 or 80 stations, and uh, was working there for about a year, year and a half, and then uh, decided I, I wanted to expand a little bit, go from radio to television. I had an opportunity to work at a public uh, television and radio station in Marquette, Michigan, at Northern Michigan University, and I, I was there for about a year, year and a half, and then I, I Got a job at the CBS affiliate in Wausau, Wisconsin. I was there again for about a year, year and a half. I was anchoring, reporting, producing. Uh, had a you know very interesting uh, experience doing all of that. I, I liked doing it very much. And then I, I moved from there to Scranton, Pennsylvania, to work at the CBS affiliate in Scranton. And I was there for about a year, year and a half, doing the same thing. Then a a job opened up in in Ann Arbor, Michigan. There was a a brand new Catholic uh, uh, PM magazine type program, a national program that was uh, getting just just getting underway out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, I applied for that, and I got the job. I was a national uh, line producer for uh, the Heart of the Nation, which is this new program that was. 
again, kind of like a PM Magazine type program. And I did that, unfortunately, just for about five or six months, and the funding for that uh, just kind of uh, went away, and uh, that, that operation closed. But I, I really enjoyed that. We were focusing at all of the work that I was doing. I was, I was really spirit-centered. I was doing all kinds of work, interviewing governors, uh, artists, musicians, uh, all kinds of interesting people, uh, doing uh, uh, profiles of Miami's archdiocese and their, I, I think it was their 50th anniversary, and just just a wonderful experience traveling around the country, meeting just wonderful, spirit-filled people, and doing lots of uh, uh, work for the Lord that uh, that was very satisfying to me. So I was kind of sad when it. You know, it it went away just because of the funding, and and at the time, you know, I you know, you talk about, you know, questioning, you know, God, why this? I mean, I, I this is perfect. If you led me to this position right here, and, and this is great, and you know, why close the door on this? And you know, I I did scratch my head and wonder at times, but then you just accept it, and uh, moved on. And where I moved on from there, I went into public relations, and I I, I got a job uh, working at a. Michigan's largest public relations firm in the Renaissance Center in downtown Detroit, and I was there for about 10 years. I uh, just grew over the 10 years. I, the last three years there, I was a vice president uh, of, uh, of the firm and did you know work for all kinds of uh, companies, uh, uh, advertising companies, car companies, uh, retailers, law firms, all kinds of things, just doing marketing communications work. From there, I uh, started my own business with a partner for about three years and uh, then was hired by a client of ours to be the marketing manager at a software company. And I was there uh, doing that, marketing communications management for uh, Fortune 500 companies for about the next eight years. During that time, uh, you know, it was satisfying work. I, I really feel like I was a, a, a communicator. That's what I love to do, to communicate and, and to, to be able to uh, do it well. And I started on the side uh, writing a novel. And uh, during, during that period, uh, uh, I had, uh, it was right after 9-11. I, my book is uh, about 9-11. And uh, I think what happened with that just kind of inspired me, you know, to write the book and, and take my life in another direction. I felt like that was a calling that, that, you know, God had led me to. I mean, it was something in the back of my mind that I, I've always loved to do and was interested in doing, but never really felt the calling. But for something, I had a, just an incredible pull at the time. After 9-11, I had to process things and work things out in my own mind, you know, about 9-11 with myself spiritually, my soul, and everything else. And the only way that I could really process it and work it out was through a, a story that, uh, you know, I, I, I just developed. Now, the book, uh, the novel, actually is entitled A Time To. Uh, how long did it actually take you to uh, write this, Ron? Well, it, it was about four and a half to five years of writing it, probably another year or two of editing it, and... Uh, I finally got final edits of it just in the past uh, probably three or, or four months, and, and it's finally been uh, uh, printed in print edition. I have it in print, uh, ebook format, and also an audiobook format. So it, it was a long time coming. I started, I think it was uh, about 2003, and uh, so here it is, 2011. What did you have to do to get it published? Well, uh, these days, if you're familiar with the, the publishing industry, it's going through a uh, terrific transformation. So it's almost next to impossible for a new author to get published by a traditional uh, publishing company because they, uh, just the way the dynamics are, uh, they, they don't, uh, they're not looking and they're not in the business of uh, developing new talent and, and working with new people. They're more in line with established. So what you're seeing now in the publishing industry and that I've taken advantage of is uh, a phenomenon called self-publishing with print-on-demand publishing. And I did this through Amazon. Amazon, the, the largest uh, seller of books in the world, has a publishing company called CreateSpace, and they print on demand so that 
Um, as orders come in, they, they can print them one at a time, and uh, it's not, not the way it had been with traditional publishers where you have to you know, have a big printing of you know, 10,000, 20,000 books up front and then try to sell them kind of thing. And now it's a different uh, formula, and, and I'm in the process of, of uh, following that. Uh, give us just a little flavor of the book. I know you wanted to even share a few uh, uh, passages from the book, but just give us a little brief overview of the book, if you could. Sure. Uh, as I said, 9-11 it, it is, was my inspiration. Okay, I, I felt, you know, as you and, and I'm sure millions of others, not only in this country or around the world, felt devastated by it. I mean, spiritually, you know, you, you're questioning, and you just say, God, why? Why this? How? This, this, this is something that just, it's just unimaginable. You, you just can't imagine something like this happening. You say, if, if God lets something like this happen, then, you know, anything is possible. I mean, you talk about evil being in the world, and I had to process all of that. So the story really is, you know, I, I needed somehow to kind of work things out in my mind, in my soul, to get back to where I had been, to, to kind of find love again in my soul, to find hope in my soul, to find faith, and to find charity. So those were the themes that I built my book around, the, the, the story, Faith, Hope, Love, and Charity. And it, it's basically a flashback. I mean, I, I use a lot of uh, experiences that I had that I drew from growing up in New York City in the 50s and 60s. My character... Uh, you'll see a lot of me in the characters. I mean, the main character is somebody called Al Masterson. He's a risk manager who's working in the World Trade Center on 9-11. And uh, so he is, is trapped trying to get out of the World Trade Center on 9-11 uh, before it collapses on him, and he's almost out, and then all of a sudden it starts collapsing on him while he's in there with his companions. And just as it's collapsing all around him, and they, they, they just huddle together and say, God, help us, he flashes back on his life. And the story, the main story, is about him flashing back on his life, looking back at the spiritual milestones in his life that reflect on and are powerful in terms of what did he really learn throughout his life, all of the experiences that really mattered that he would take away from with regard to faith, hope, love, and charity. And so that's what it is. It, it's him flashing back at different periods of his life uh, about learning about faith, hope, love, and charity, but not just learning about you know those moments. He's flashing back, but seeing them through new eyes, maybe God's eyes, more objective eyes, to see things that he didn't see the first time around. So he's growing in the process. He's flashing back on these milestones and these experiences, but at the same time, he's looking at it objectively, seeing, seeing it as an observer this time, and he's learning things and seeing things, and he's, and he's getting messages from a mysterious voice at times, you know, explaining and giving him insights into different things in his life that he didn't see the found. So it, it's a reflective, a story about reflection and growth and learning that really have, have a lot to do with, you know, the fundamentals uh, uh, of, of one's spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we were talking off air, and uh, you had mentioned about uh, possibly uh, sharing a little bit from the book, actually maybe reading just a bit. Uh, we have about three minutes, if you'd like to, to do that, uh, Ron. We would love to have you do just sure. a little bit of Let that for us. do something real quick. Uh, here's a, a chapter. A dream, it's called A Dream, A Cartoon, and God. At St. Peter's Catholic Church on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, in the shadows of the World Trade Center's imposing twin towers, a New York City Fire Department chaplain contemplated the dream he had had the night before. He struggled to find meaning in it, since the situation he had found himself in was so out of character. After all, when was the last time I cleared, cleaned my living quarters, he wondered. I've had a housekeeper for as long as I can remember. But there he was in his dream, dusting furniture, vacuuming dirt from the floors. The other strange thing about his dream was that he couldn't get rid of the dust. In fact, the more he cleaned, the more the dust would appear. Finally, it got so bad that he had begun choking on the dust, and that's when he had woken up. 
So it was just kind of like a premonition, I guess, of what was going to be happening. And then he, he thinks about the meeting that he had not, the night before with the firefighters at Ladder Company 6 talking about death and, and, and just talking about how they risk death all the times. And really, he's saying how much the chaplain has talked to the firefighters that they're really his hero because they risk their lives every day for strangers and there's nothing greater in, in life than to, to give up one's life for someone else, it's people that you don't even know. So that, that, that's a quick oversight. One other really quick, a couple sentences. Do we have a... Sure, you've got about, you've got about a, a minute and, okay. and so before we want to get to something else, okay. but go ahead. Okay. Here is, uh, when he's finishing up with his experience, reflecting on his experience in Ethiopia, Al came across a quote from a 1966 Haile Selassie speech to the World Evangelical Congress in Berlin. The quote says, A rudderless ship is at the mercy of the waves and the wind, drifts wherever they take it. And if there arises a whirlwind, it is smashed against the rocks and become as it never existed. It is our firm belief that a soul without Christ is bound to meet no better fate. End quote. And that's Haile Selassie's quote, the, the former emperor of Ethiopia. Now, Ron, the book is in t- or actually the novel's entitled A Time To, and uh, why don't you lay it out there for us, uh, how one can go about obtaining a copy, because that's uh, obviously uh, very important. Yeah, I, I think go to my blog. It's uh, www.ronaldlewispeterson.com blog spot b l o g spot dot com or just google ronald lewis peterson and and you'll see uh my blog you'll see a lot of i'm all over the web i guess that's probably the easiest thing and uh, you'll get an introduction i have a video trailer that that kind of talks a little bit about the story background on the story and i have links to all the different places everything from amazon to uh smash words that has and has my ebook, and uh, there's the audio book files on my site as well. So, please uh, encourage people to stop by and, and you know read what they can about it. I have free excerpts that they can read and listen to, and uh, communicate with me. And I communicate with anyone who uh, does email me. Uh, one one last thing, which is uh, the reason we ram on ram on, obviously, is to uh, be a witness to. Those that do not know Jesus is the Lord and Savior, and Ron, if there's a moment or two in your life where you just said, you know, Lord, what you did was really, really awesome, or a time in your life that uh, something happened that was really special, could you remember what that is and maybe share it with us? Yeah, I, I think what's happening to me right now, I mean, I believe me, I, I have, uh, you know, the whole, I think, Everything that I have done up to this moment, I've given you an outline, outline basically I've done a lot of things in my life, but I think everything that I've done up to this minute, up to this moment, has really been in preparation for me what I'm doing next, okay? And, and so it, I, I have that the sense and the strong feeling that, you know, I'm listening to God and he, He's speaking to me and through this, and I, I'm finally doing really maybe what I should have been doing a long time ago if somehow I, I would have been more attentive to, to what, what God was telling me and listening to his, his whispers in my ear and in my soul of, of what he wanted me to be doing. And that's, that, that's it. I, I mean, I, I just, I have a sense that, you know, my best work, the things, you know, I mentioned how my dad, you know, influenced thousands of people's lives through his uh, ministry with alcoholism, and, and I, I hope to do the same through my writing. I'm sure the Lord will continue to bless you, our guest once again. Tonight on Second Chances has been Ron Peterson, and his uh, novel's entitled A Time To, and Ron, we have about uh, 15 seconds, one more time, how you can obtain a copy. Okay, just visit my, my blog or, uh, you know, Google Ronald Lewis Peterson on Amazon.com or, or Google Ronald Lewis Peterson on the, on the web. You'll find me, and uh, I look forward to, uh, you know, communicating with everyone. Well, tune in next Tuesday night for more Second Chances right here at Lift FM 98.5 and 97.9 on your FM radio dial.